Hi everyone. Imagine that the next pill you take doesn't just contain chemicals, but rather a tiny robot. This is the world of nanomedicine, trying to build robots and other constructs that operate at the scale of a billionth of a meter. It's tough. The potential is vast, however, such as being able to directly cure cancer by targeting rogue cells. Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts, nanotechnology, nanomedicine, and future of medical nanotech. Part one, what is nanotechnology? The simple definition is that nanotechnology is built for some purpose at the scale of nanometers. To understand nanometers, let's draw some comparisons. What exactly is a nanometer? Well, there are a thousand nanometers in a micrometer, and there are a thousand micrometers in a millimeter, which you may have heard of. And just to complete the picture, there are a thousand millimeters in a meter. So that means you have to start with a meter and then take one part per thousand and then do that three times. That's a nanometer or a billionth of a meter. Some of these terms might sound familiar if you followed CPU manufacturing at all. And actually modern day CPUs do exist on the scale of billionths of a meter. The so-called lithography size is typically a marketing term, but you'll hear phrases like five nanometer process, three nanometer process, and two nanometer process. That last one is quite new, but IBM has come out with a production ready two nanometer process, which has about five atoms per transistor in the chips that they make. Again, these lithography sizes are actually a marketing term. So the five nanometer process isn't actually five nanometers across, it's much larger than that, but it's still nanometer scale and five atoms sounds pretty close to atomically precise manufacturing. However, it's important to note that CPUs are static constructs. The atoms inside them are at fixed positions and not designed to move around at all. The magic happens through electricity, which is basically electrons passing from one atom to the next doing so easily when the material is very conductive, like silicon or copper, and not conducting through the barriers that surround those elements. So the molecules don't move around and they certainly don't operate independently. They're just there to act as conduits for electrons. You might've heard of the buzzword nanobot, and this doesn't sound like nanobots, right? CPUs are just static fixed constructs, but nanobots are supposed to be able to move around the world and perform actions. If you remember the scale I mentioned before, from a meter to millimeter to micrometer, Micrometer is one millionth of a meter, and currently we have robots at around that scale, between 0.1 and 10 micrometers in size. But they can and do operate on the nanometer scale. And just to draw a comparison with biology, micrometer scale is about the same size as bacteria, while nanometer scale is about the same size as viruses. Manufacturing robots or anything really at that scale is extremely difficult, as you might imagine. Semiconductor manufacturing facilities are hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to construct. There's a theoretical technology called a nanofactory that would actually assemble an object atom by atom. So you could specify exactly where you wanted every atom to be, and it could 3D print it essentially to construct any object. The way it would probably be built is to have a series of little arms that can move atoms into place, single atoms at a time, forming slightly larger intermediate building blocks, which then get passed along to the next step in the assembly line, which then takes these slightly larger blocks and assembles them together to form even larger structures and so on. And you can basically have an assembly line of ever larger arms until you have the final steps appearing at the macro scale and you can produce a macroscopic object as the output. But at that very small scale, Physics is very non-intuitive and full of quantum effects. For example, if you think about a modern assembly line and the arms that are moving things around, they can only operate at several hertz. Like they might be able to perform several actions per second, but not break the laws of physics, of course. But a nanoscale factory arm that's moving one atom into place at a time could actually operate at the scale of gigahertz. So it could potentially move billions of atoms around every second. Again, nanofactories are a theoretical technology, but it does seem like we're leading in that direction. Because bacteria and viruses are roughly the same size as nanobots, scientists are taking a lot of cues from how nature has evolved mechanisms to try to figure out how to import them into nanobots. Here's an example from Professor Bradley Nelson. Bacteria like E. coli have a tiny little tail that actually rotates and in doing so propels the bacteria through its environment. The tail is a special construct about 40 to 50 nanometers across, and it spins at several hundred revolutions per minute, perhaps the world's tiniest biological motor. So we have a lot to learn about how to construct nanobots, but I think one of the main takeaways is your intuition doesn't really apply about how fast things can move or how difficult it might be to construct something because quantum effects might get in your way. Part two, nanomedicine. One of the main things we want to do with nanotechnology and nanobots 
is to treat illnesses in the human body. Because nanobots are operating at around the same scale as the cells that are in your body, they could potentially affect very personalized and targeted medicine. Other than the difficulty of manufacturing these entities in the first place, the main problem is that the nanotech has to be compatible with your body. In other words, you don't want it to be attacked by your immune system, which might think it's an oddly shaped bacteria. And if the nanobot is damaged or destroyed, you don't want its component molecules to be something that's harmful to the human body. For example, hardware engineers love using rare earths, but you really don't want some stray cadmium floating around in your bloodstream. One of the most promising techniques is to use biological building blocks that we already understand. For example, by using DNA to construct nanorobots. There's a technique called DNA origami, which basically leverages DNA to auto fold into certain shapes. I gather it's a little bit like protein folding, right? If you construct a certain molecule, it will actually fold itself into the lowest energy state which is a really cheap and easy way to do 3D manufacturing at a tiny scale. There was some work in 2018 by Arizona State University and the University of Sydney and possibly others where they used DNA origami to create self-assembling nano barrels. Basically a 3D enclosed space like a container or a barrel that can actually carry a payload. It can carry some other molecules to a destination. The nano barrels are about 30 nanometers by 30 nanometers, which I think would be quite difficult to construct but again, by asking the DNA to fold itself into that particular configuration, not too bad. What the researchers did is they put RNA inside the nano barrel, and that RNA is designed to disable a certain gene in cells. They say that it silences a targeted gene. They then put a propulsion mechanism on these nano barrels, some kind of enzyme that produces an exothermic reaction, and that's enough to propel the barrel along in a certain direction. I think of this as burning fuel, so to speak. I believe the researchers were dropping tons of nano barrels into the bloodstream and they were just propelling themselves off in random directions to eventually get throughout the whole body. And you might be wondering where this is going, but the next step is that the researchers added a particular chemical that was a sensor that could detect the exterior of cancer cells. And it would basically try to enter the cell membrane only if it was right next to a cancer cell. So let me summarize for a minute. The researchers created some RNA that could really damage a cancer cell. They then took some DNA and used DNA origami to fold itself into a barrel that contained that RNA. The barrel has some kind of weird propulsion mechanism on it to move it throughout the bloodstream. And it even has a sensor on it to detect when it's bumping into a cancer cell and let itself in. So what's the last step of this process? You have this little time bomb inside the cancer cells, but it doesn't open on its own. So finally, the researchers added a particular element inside this nano barrel that would melt if exposed to a particular RF frequency. And that would basically dissolve the nano barrel, or at least open it up, spill out the deadly RNA, and that RNA would float around in the cancer cell until it actually found the DNA there that the cancer cell was relying on, and it would silence a critical part of that DNA, and the cancer cell would basically go to sleep. Now, this is not in human trials yet. The researchers did it in mice and pigs, but the whole operation took less than 48 hours, they would just, I guess, inject these nano barrels, wait for a while, and then beam the RF frequency to the particular cancerous location inside that creature's body. And if any of the nano barrels had made their way into a cancer cell, they would shut down those cancer cells. Wow, that's futuristic. I imagine there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So this type of technology, of course, takes a while to make it make its way to human trials. But even just realizing that it might be possible is incredible. And as you can see, nanobots don't look exactly like you might imagine a robot to be. There's no CPU, there's no digital logic. It's much too small for that. It's various chemicals combining in a very smart way to create a very special purpose and tiny nanobot. Actually, I did find a note on the internet that there are currently 15 FDA approved drugs for treating cancer that use nanotechnology. I don't know if that means they all contain nanobots, perhaps not, or perhaps we're just a little too strict with that term in terms of our understanding. For example, the mRNA COVID vaccines utilize nanotechnology as well. They actually contain the instructions to ask your body to mass produce virus spike protein lookalikes. So it's just a bit of RNA that asks your body, please produce this, which is very similar to that cancer example with a bit of RNA that says, please shut down this gene. So I think in some ways, Nanotech and nanobots are already here. We just don't recognize them because we think they'll look like robots. Part three, future of medical nanotech. 
As we already discussed, I think it would be difficult to make a nanobot with substantial computational capabilities, perhaps by utilizing quantum entanglement or something so that you can link the nanobot to a larger object, or perhaps by having more like microbots, which of course can be a thousand times larger than a nanobot, but that's still about the size of cells and they could operate within your body and do computation, communication with the outside world, etc. So you might have a lot of different scales of nanobots operating at once. However it happens, futurist Ray Kurzweil predicts that medical nanobots will be commonplace by the 2030s. They'll be in everyone's bloodstream, looking for problems, checking up on our health, and taking intervention as well so that we stay as healthy as possible. He is particularly interested in trying to solve the problem of high bandwidth brain computer interfaces. We can only get so far with external scans and understanding what's happening in the brain dynamically is very difficult. However, if you had a swarm of very small nanobots, they could actually go through your blood system, infiltrate your brain, and just sit there and observe what's happening, communicate with the neurons through electrical charges or the release of hormones and other chemicals. And I think there's two major consequences of this. First is that we would expand our thinking capacity, as Kurzweil calls it, creating artificial neocortex. And that, of course, is basically the beginning of the singularity because that allows us to exponentially expand the size and capacities of our brains. And the second big change is that those nanobots could probably provide virtual and augmented reality that seems just as real as IRL because they could fake phantom signals coming from anywhere in your nervous system. It's really hard to imagine how those two abilities would change the world. But again, I think it's safe to say that at that stage, the technological singularity would not be too far away. Back to the current for a moment. The nanotech market was already worth 121 billion in 2020. And there's one estimate out there that says it will grow 25% every year until 2029. And about 35% of the investment in nanotech is going to be focused on medical applications, which is incredible because obviously nanotech has substantial implications for CPU manufacturing in all kinds of fields, but 35% focused on how to make medical nanobots, personalize medicine, cure cancer, and make Ray Kurzweil's dreams come true. I want to also add that AI can really help us in terms of nano manufacturing. Basically, because there are so many quantum effects going on, it's really hard to figure out what actual physical construct will actually do what you want, like create a motor that can turn around. Nature, of course, has had billions of years to figure out all these different configurations, and we can and will copy it for inspiration wherever we can. But at some point, having an entity that can reason about atoms and how they behave and how they interact down to the quantum scale is going to be essential. I'll leave you with one quote that I found fascinating. In the same way that neural networks could help computers code themselves, nanocomputing technologies could allow computers to build themselves. Finally, in conclusion, we talked a lot about what nanotechnology is, what nanobots are and what they look like, and the fact that they don't really look like robots the way we would envision them, at least currently when we're taking a lot of insight from how biological entities exist at that nanoscale. There seems to be nanomedicine already that uses nanotech to produce personalized or targeted medications. And in the future, that will only accelerate. An interesting question in my mind is, how can you make nanobots that are a little less single purpose, that can coordinate swarms of other nanobots, communicate with the outside world, and so on? Right now, it looks like you'd have to use larger bots to do that, but who knows what the future will hold. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made about AI doctors and AI drugs. Please like, subscribe, and send this video to a friend that you think might like it. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.